Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Inside Scoop and Emerald Planet. All the ecology news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's your host, Executive Director of the Emerald Planet, Dr. Sam Lee Hancock. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. in the United States, looking sword. around the globe in 143 different nations, looking for those thousand best practices, the technologies, the services, and the products that we move through the, to 2050 and to the end of this century. We're looking at various technologies, services, and products that are making a difference as we move towards 2050 calling this segment the Paving the Way to 2050 Future Earth. But one of the things that we also look at from time to time is the policy issues that are being faced by citizens and local communities and regions and nations and how it impacts on what they're doing as far as international development and international aid issues. Uh, we have a specialist with us who's been involved around the globe for a number of years. His name is John S. Uh, Quackenboss, who is the president uh, and of uh, the L&Q International. And uh, I'm going to add in there as far as uh, advanced soil solutions, which is part of what you're doing. John, welcome. Thank you, Sam. Glad it's to have you to on. Here. Glad to have you on the Emerald Planet. Tell us a little bit about uh, L&Q International. It's history, and then we'll get into you know the essence of the technologies, but also some of the policy issues that are faced. Okay. Um, L&Q International was formed about five years ago and uh, stemmed from Lockwood and Quackenboss. Earl Lockwood, our, my senior partner, uh, is, uh, and I uh, were introduced to uh, compressed earthen block. And uh, we had not seen this technology before and we realized just how valuable uh, this compressed earthen block was uh, for all manner of building and from there we sort of rolled on into soil stabilization and into the waterproofing of soil which is a new area. Well I think what you're doing is uh, really fantastic because you're using local resources, you're training local people so you're adding to the green job base of that area but also it helps to expand the tax base in these local communities not just in North America but all over the globe. Well, that's right. That's right. And uh, what we have tried to do is expand this uh, tax base with products that uh, were environmentally sound and sustainable and at the same time gave uh, an economic advantage over anything that was currently being used. Yeah, let's uh, go to these slides and uh, see what we have here as far as the different types of things that you're actually doing with L&Q uh, International. If we can uh, get the slides back, uh, we'll have those in just a few seconds. Uh, explain a little bit about the, uh, the products and, and the methods that you use for doing this because it's something that's uh, quite unique where you can just actually take a, a raw local product and turn it into something almost instantly very useful. Well, we've got products and we've got uh, solutions and we've got packages that we combine them all into, you see. And the, the products themselves really are technically advanced in that uh, the chemicals that we've got uh, are being used now in the stabilization of soils where they hadn't been. Typically, of course, you use uh, cement or lime to stabilize product, but now we're able to go on and use silicates to waterproof soil. We're able to use polymers that uh, can be introduced into the soil to harden it and sort of plasticize it. And we're able to use enzymes uh, to, well, enzymes to harden and, and, uh, and uh, allow uh, clays, I'm sorry, allow soils with heavy clays to be worked with effectively. Well, I think this is one of the things, uh, looking at this, uh, these two samples that we have here side by side, it's really interesting how you can use anything that's uh, really heavy clays all the way into sandy loam into just sand itself. Yeah. And again, to take something that's whatever is within the local communities, wherever they are around the globe, but turn it into a useful product that people there can use and they're familiar with because it's the style and the nature of what they do and how they use their own local uh, 
soils and their own local products. E exactly. And uh, when we were looking at, uh, at all of the advantages that these products offered, we were able to go on and determine you know, that uh, not only roads could be built, but berms could be built. And you could build housing and schools and clinics and all of this, all with soil. And, uh, See, that's the amazing, it, amazing part about all this, John, is that <clears throat> you're able to do this, again, using local labor and uh, relatively inexpensive uh, technologies and techniques to be able to do all this. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, the, uh, the products basically are all water-soluble. And so, literally, if you, once you know the mix that's necessary for the particular soil, you just add water. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, your equipment, uh, it's uh, very sustainable because everything is able to be made on uh, it, quite easily. Uh, there is nothing that requires specialized equipment, uh, nor does it require really uh, skilled labor. Well, I think it's uh, really interesting uh, what you're doing. Uh, let's go back to the quality of the water and the nature of the water that you're using because not all water is water is water because some of it has brine, you know, has salt True. in it. Uh, some of it, you know, is he very heavy uh, particulate matter, uh, some with heavy metals and other kinds of things. So in local communities, is there any special way that you need to filter or process yeah. the water? Mm -hmm. Or you could just about, as long as it's liquid, you can use it. Well, uh, we say that you can use gray water with this. Clean water right. to gray water. Mm -hmm. But in terms of going on and adding heavy metals in the water or, or using salt water, uh, no, the salt does not work. Okay, so what you need then is to have uh, any kind of, uh, uh, in essence, some type of fresh water that can be used that's, that's right. potable to uh, gray, and gray water is, is water that comes off of uh, the, rain, the roofs or uh, out of the sinks and, and those kinds of things. Does, the, does any type of uh, detergents in the water, people washing dishes and clothing and all that, can they then take and use this water in order with uh, your product? Or do they need to have things that would have no uh, surfactants or any kind of detergents in it? I would say that we, you'd be better off not experimenting with the surfactants out there, uh, but it's not been tried, to tell mm -hmm. you the truth. Well, that may be uh, something to think about so. because, uh, you know, uh, water scarcity, uh, an average family of about six in some of these developing countries, they have about three and a half gallons a day for six people, which yeah. is, you know, in the United States, we use about 75 gallons per day for one person. So. You know, it's a huge difference. So, uh, you know, the types of water is, is really critical to, uh, to all of that. Oh, I'm just about ready. This is a slide I really wanted to get to. This is the amazing part of what you're doing, John, and how you're doing. Just, just talk about this slide. What's going on here? Well, uh, what we have in here is uh, a vinyl acetate polymer. It's completely safe. It's water soluble, and we've added that into a 1,600-gallon tank of water, and we've mixed it with just a, a simple uh, circulation motor. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the back of the trailer, you'll see that there's a 14-foot-long PVC pipe uh, that we've uh, put some nozzles in for spray tips. Uh, and, uh, and basically, uh, we are putting out a uh, balanced uh, amount of product onto a surface, uh, a dirt surface, that we're waterproofing there. And it's as simple as that. Uh, there's no special equipment. It's being pulled by a pickup truck, but you could pull it by two oxen just as easily. Yeah, and uh, it just depends on the, the weight in that. But I think this is really uh, is a classic example, John, of how simple it is that you're doing, that you take your product, you mix it with water, and then you, you, then you put it to use. Exactly, yeah. And, and so what you're doing then is, uh, so if you have places, uh, say, in India, Bangladesh, you know, all the countries around the globe, uh, monsoon season, this would be one way to help to try to maintain the dirt roads within many of these communities, and many of these dirt roads tie into uh, major cities. Certainly. I mean, uh, keeping the roads open 12 months a year is key to any community because people can get to school, people can get to their clinics, agricultural products can go back and forth between centers.
and uh, and you can easily repair potholes and washouts with these. Well, this this really goes to the heart of uh, what you're doing, and this is how we actually first met when I was looking at the uh, the brick oh. that you're uh, making and uh, this brick machine. Tell us what we're seeing here. How do you uh, mix this and uh, and really the essence of uh, making brick from local soils within local communities. Well, uh, these uh, CEBs, or compressed earthen block, are coming out of a machine which is uh, made by AECT, but uh, in any event, this is, we believe it's the finest machine in the United States. And uh, it, uh, it basically produces, this is a small machine, it produces 240 block an hour. There's a larger version that produces 480 block an hour, but this small machine weighs about 1,600 pounds and uh, can be pulled by a car or by a person. Uh, it's and put in place. And put in place, and, and now you've got to pay attention to getting your clays correct along with your sand a mix, but once you've got a consistency that's adequate, you just fill it into the top of the hopper and the machine begins producing perfect block like that. That is 100% earth right there. And that's using, uh, again, the uh, product that you're providing through uh, the, uh, your own company and uh, it's very easy and very inexpensive as far as the local communities are concerned. Then. Yes, and uh, there, are, um, there are ruggedized versions that, uh, and, and that really is a version that we sell because you don't want things to break down in the outback with all the spare parts. And uh, you'll see the, the chemical products that we provide can go on and waterproof the block as well as shown in this slide. So what you're doing then is, again, this is making it a 12-month-of-year uh, uh, seasonal product. So if you have heavy monsoons, you don't have to worry about the, the rock uh, disintegrating from that's, all the heavy moisture that, that's that, right. that goes into it. So. That's especially, uh, you're especially vulnerable for the first 90 days when the block is green and it hasn't cured right. yet. And, and so this is actually going up. We're just about running out of time, so I'm just uh, going through... Uh, as far as uh, you know, some of these slides. This is one of the uh, the trailers that you have. But uh, leaving off on the training, we have just about uh, 20 seconds left. Tell us about training, the importance. Of it. Well, we have uh, developed a training center outside of Memphis, Tennessee, about 30 minutes outside of Memphis, Tennessee, where we've got uh, demonstration plots, but we've also set aside 44 acres just for learning how to go on and construct roads, be able to take ditches and waterproof them, prevent erosion, uh, build with the earthen block, build That's structures. That's what we have time for, John. Thank you very much for being with us. Well, thank we you. come to you and create the Emerald Planet. to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we look around the globe in 143 different nations looking for those thousand best practices as the Earth moves from seven to nine billion souls by 2050. So the Emerald Planet and the Emerald Planet TV is looking at all these different technologies, the services and the products and how can we increase the quality of life and quality of living for these uh, new two uh, billion people that will be joining us uh, on the planet and also the policies that are going to need to be implemented to address many of these issues as far as how to create new jobs, to uh, bring in infrastructure, uh, education, health care, fresh water, uh, sanitation, food, all of the things that we are faced with as we move through the 21st century. We have a gentleman who's been working at this and thinking about this for a long time. He's coming to us uh, by Skype uh, from his office, John Nigel, who is the technical director of Enterprise Works, which is one of the major divisions of Relief International. John, I think you're with us. Hi, Sam. Hey, welcome and uh, glad to have you uh, with us and thank you for joining us by Skype. Well, thanks. It's good to be with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Relief International first, and then we'll get into the division that you're working with, uh, Enterprise Works. 
Sure. Relief International is involved in about 30 countries around the world, providing assistance to people um, after z disasters, both natural and uh, man-caused disasters, war and uh, conflict. Um, and the Enterprise Works Division follows up on the relief effort and comes in once the conflict situation is a bit resolved, we can come in and start working with businesses to develop economic activity. Well, I so think it's really fantastic. Process. And I understand, uh, although I was thinking the Enterprise Works uh, was a uh, new division of Relief International, actually Enterprise Works has been around quite a while. Yeah, we've been around uh, about 35 years, um, starting as Appropriate Technology International. We changed our name and we work with businesses uh, to develop uh, economic activity. Well, uh, you've given us a little bit of what I was going to ask you about uh, next as far as uh, Enterprise Works, but give us a little more in-depth overview of Enterprise Works and why you think it's important that uh, people actually were able to generate their own small to medium scale businesses to improve their communities instead of what we think of as a classical international aid uh, type of development. Right, Sam, we're really committed to working with businesses because we feel that when people make a profit, they're going to get involved in the activity and really put their heart and soul into it because they're earning part of their daily bread from it. So it's really critical for us to have something that is sustainable long after the donor money ends. And this is why we really like the business approach. And we want to bring up a couple of slides, and I think we're going to uh, put this in. So we'll have you on the screen as well as the uh, slide, John. But looking at the types of uh, solutions and the applications that uh, Enterprise Works has actually been advocating and developing over the years, uh, how do you actually implement these in uh, many of these LDCs, these least developed countries? Well, Sam, we really look at the situation country by country and see where there's a need and where there is an economic activity that we can support through training, product promotion, product development, so that people can actually locally either make the material or provide a service. We're always looking for a product or a service that people can sell for a profit, but that have a social benefit. Uh, it's really important for us to have the win-win, the where the businesses are earning a profit. This is a treadle pump on a tube well. Both the drilled well is done by a local business that we've trained and equipped, and the treadle pump is made in a local small workshop. This way, a gardener can contract directly with a local business for both the well and the pump. Well, so and also looking at this. dollars they can triple the size of their garden. Well, looking at this, John, uh, also, too, it, it looks very simple. You have a gentleman there uh, actually drilling his uh, own well, but uh, you could maybe have a number seven or, or ten even other small to medium scale uh, businesses that are supporting this and are part of this entire supply chain within some of these very small and local communities. Uh, that's correct. Uh, you know, when you take someone who can invest $100 and the same year pay it back from the produce from their garden. Um, I had one gardener in Niger tell me that his treadle pump sent him to Mecca. So this was pretty important for him. Well, and uh, looking at this as far as the uh, local community is concerned to uh, drill their own uh, well and have it so that it's actually uh, part of the community, uh, I know one of the things that you do through uh, Enterprise Works that you actually uh, even in some uh, communities where, you know, the men and women are uh, separated from each other. Actually, you try, uh, my understanding is that you try to involve all the citizens of the community to determine the type of business and also maybe even the, the placement and the location of uh, the water, the gardens, those types of things. But in general, Sam, we're working very closely with the, the people. You know, when you're working with a business approach, you view people as clients. We don't view them as beneficiaries. So when you look at people as clients, you have to respond to their needs, to what they want. Um, if you noticed in that picture, that was a rope pump um, that was supplied by Rotary International in Niger. 
Well, uh, looking at that, uh, if we can go back to that slide, I know we're trying to have the slides and you on at the same time, John, but it's really important, and I think this goes to the heart of the policy issues uh, that we're talking about as far as uh, international development and aid, is uh, how do you really involve the people but have long-term involvement? It's not just for this particular well or uh, this particular gardening type of project, but you want to have long-term commitment by the local communities uh, uh, for future generations. This is, this is true, and, and this is where the business approach comes in and is critical. It, although the communities get the well or they get the well for their garden, uh, they're purchasing it. Uh, when they purchase for a garden well, the gardener actually buys it directly from a, another business in the same local community. As long as everyone in the chain is earning a profit, then the activities continue. If you take the profit out, what happens is once the funding ends, so does the activity. And this is what we're trying to avoid. Yeah, looking at this, and I know training is a very integral part of what you're doing. And also I have uh, John uh, Quackenboss, who's president of Ellen uh, Q International with me, just in case we lose you by Skype. Uh, John and I will pick up and talk about this, but in both of your enterprises, you really focus on training. So how do you go about providing training to the citizens in these uh, local communities? Uh, generally, we look for uh, entrepreneurs uh, who are already engaged in some sort of business activity, and then we train them gradually by, it's a, it's a process. Uh, we train them to either market a product or to make a product. Uh, the training is always step by step. We both do, we do technical training, we do business training, we help them find financing. Uh, when a business gets involved with us, for example, if they're buying product or they're buying tools to do an activity, over time they reimburse this. And this is important because that way the business is fully committed and fully engaged into the activity. Well, I think that's very important, and also it's uh, going back to the proverbial train the trainer type of idea, uh, where you're diffusing information throughout the entire society. But I think if we think back to that earlier slide where you had the ladies at the at the well, you have the children there. So you really, as you're doing this, John, you're training uh, future generations at the same time. <laughs> of those that are actually engaged in the business activity today. That's true. Exactly, and, and the children are really the future. Uh, it's very interesting to see them fully involved. Uh, these last two slides were of our newest product. It's a rainwater storage tank. It's being marketed under the brand name Bob. Um, we have about 2,000 of them in Uganda now that have been sold over the last 18 months. They're sold through small retail shops like this one. Um, sold for a profit, but it's still affordable. It's uh, about one third of the cost of a similar size tank on the market in Uganda, where we're doing the commercial pilot. That's fantastic. Uh, John's sitting with me again as a backup, and I'm going to let him actually ask the next question. Well, you know, John, this is all very interesting, and I was just wondering, uh, we've seen your water pump and your uh, rain collectors, but could you give a few more examples of the types of products that you've been able to get out to the market and how they've affected people? Sure, John. Uh, happy to do that. We've been working in uh, products uh, in household energy as well, uh, both in India and in West Africa, working with uh, improved um, fuel-efficient cook stoves. Uh, in Ghana, we marketed under the brand Joppa and they're currently selling 100,000 units a year. Uh, we've also worked on a siphon filter that's a low-cost filter for uh, improving the quality of water. So we work in a wide variety. We've worked in agro-processing, uh, cashew processing. Again, we always try and scale the technology down to as small a unit as possible so that the end user can invest their own money and become involved. Mm -hmm. Well, and also, too, in doing that, John, you're really uh, scaling it to the level where it could be maintained and have the technical expertise 
uh, from within the local community. In some of the uh, villages and communities you're working in, do you work with like the local technical high school or maybe the community colleges or maybe even a, a university in some of the uh, education training that you're doing? Uh, we have in the past worked with um, uh, technical colleges so that they're helping to train their students in these technologies. It, it's interesting that some of the technologies have been tried in the past, but they've sort of been lost. And we're trying to bring things like manual drilling back into the mainstream. Uh, it's a very effective way of reducing the cost. And ultimately, it doesn't matter how you make a hole. You can make it by hand, or you can make it with a $250,000 machine. The hole is the same. That's, that's what's important. Well, John, thank you uh, very much for uh, being with us. Uh, John Nigel, who is the technical director of Relief International and their special division called Enterprise Works. And as uh, John shared with us, we can see it certainly does as we create the Emerald Planet. <coughs> you don't need that. We're back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we talk about a series called Paving the Way to 2050. And this is called Future Earth. But we're not going to have a future Earth if we don't plan properly and to develop the infrastructure, the technologies, the services, and the products that are going to be useful as we move towards a planet that has 9 billion in about 2050. And we're looking for those individuals that have uh, long years of experience, but also have very practical uh, technologies, very practical examples of things that are actually working in different countries around the globe. One of those is uh, Ted Vogel, who is the president of uh, 12 South and I've added to your name on their energy services so people will know what it is, Ted, but uh, welcome to the Emerald Planet. Thank you for having me. Uh, Ted, you've been uh, working on uh, providing solutions. These are alternatives as far as energy, food, and uh, water, and many of the other uh, infrastructure and the basic needs that people have. Tell us a little bit about 12 South and why the name 12 South? Um, well, the name 12 South actually comes from a highway that runs down the coast of North Carolina. Very quickly, I was told to name it after something memorable and notable. It's also a very windy place. So uh, my company got started uh, working for a private firm in North Carolina installing the second largest grid-connected wind turbine in the state to date. Um, so I dealt with a lot of things with state and local legislation, public advocacy, state utility commission, and basically moved that into looking at distributed generation projects. So distributed generation is power behind the meter, so solar power on the roof of your house to offset your own electric bill. In my case, I started looking more at larger distributed generation projects, um, 400 kilowatt wind turbines for high schools, uh, large solar thermal arrays for um, any type of high demand hot water need, like dining facilities for schools and things like that. Um, I left that company in 2009, formed my own company, and since then have been working on specifically aid-related power scenarios where you're looking at uh, outside the continental U.S., uh, disaster relief, um, somewhat military operations as well, and then basically diesel electric power efficiency and loading. Well, I think this is something that we uh, really don't think much about if you're in a country that's really, uh, virtually everything is tied to the grid, whether it's here or Japan, Korea. Uh, most of Western Europe, uh, but when you get into countries and you know about this because you've actually worked in these countries where it could be 85% of the people either have very limited access to the grid or no access whatsoever, so it's hard to envision that. So looking at these uh, communities where the, the, the backup diesel generator really is the power grid that you have, mm -hmm. how do you integrate this together so that we're going to what you're calling the hybrid generation? Um, well, just taking a step back, if you consider the Valserve model that Dr. Linton Wells and Star Tides has put together, uh, three of the principal components of any type of development scenario is access to information, access to communications, access to power. 
um, they're all built off of power. So without power, you can't run an aid camp. You can't revitalize a hospital to get it up and running after a disaster. So looking at specifically diesel as the only source of power, the first thing that you need to do is make sure you're running it correctly. Uh, very often, most of the scenarios I see, the generators are grossly oversized compared to the loads that they're serving, or they have time of day differentials, where you might only have one size generator. If you still need to power something at 3 o'clock in the morning, you're running it at very low speed, which is very inefficiently, whereas at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you might be running it at a higher speed and at greater efficiency. By modeling these things virtually, it actually allows you to make some choices about how you set your power systems up. Well, looking at that, I know this is something that's very important because in many of these countries, getting access to uh, diesel or uh, LNG, you know, any kind of uh, mm -hmm. natural gas product is very difficult. It's quite expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, supply chains, in many cases, either are sporadic or even broken, particularly in, if you have uh, you know, internally displaced peoples, either by war or famine or natural disaster. And so how do you look at uh, the renewables as far as solar, wind, low flow hydro, and some of these others out there mm -hmm. to either augment or actually be able to take the generators mostly offline and uh, power through uh, the renewables? Well, the nice thing about considering a hybrid system is you can also consider in all of the options that you just mentioned. Uh, solar and wind technologies are incredibly robust. Uh, a simple definition of a hybrid system is actually just diesel electric with a battery bank. Um, in that scenario, the battery is considered the load. The diesel generator runs at an optimal speed until the battery bank is full, then it shuts down. Um, the slide that you can see on screen right now is actually a representation of a hybrid system that is uh, diesel generators, batteries, wind turbines, and photovoltaics. And it gives you basically your decision-making matrices based on net present cost. And that's sort of how the whole analysis works on my end. In the developing world, and specifically in the projects I've looked at in the Caribbean and Afghanistan, the nice thing about it is, is that you can go in with diesel now, because that's today's technology. You can get liquid fuel now, again, today's technology. But with this hybridization, it allows you to move towards renewables, and it allows you to move towards, um, well, lots of things, local enterprise startups. Uh, you know, There's a lot of different things that can back having wind and solar in places like this. Well, look at it, when you talk about as far as the renewables being very robust, this is something uh, when you have a uh, grid-centric society, it's very difficult to look at you know, solar, wind, low-flow hydro as being robust. Mm -hmm. But yet, if, if we really focused on the renewables and looked at from the standpoint of you know, the grid is getting old, creaky, and uh, the expenses are going up dramatically, is that really now is the time to be looking at these alternatives, and I think that's what you're getting at, Ted, mm -hmm. is that, and I believe that's what you're doing, is looking for the return on investment, ROI, exactly. and how to do it now so you're not doing it when it truly is a real emergency. Without a doubt. And the thing in the, all of these considerations, if you are working outside of the U.S., say in Haiti or in, in Aceh with the tsunami, would you rather move medical supplies and personnel, or would you rather move water and fuel? So if you have electricity on site, you can run desalination. If you want to move fuel, that's, you know, it's, it's very cumbersome, it's very expensive. Some of the better numbers I've seen for Central Asia, it takes eight gallons of fuel to get one gallon of power out of that fuel. So it takes seven gallons of f fuel to move diesel fuel over land to point of consumption. So it's grossly inefficient. I was going to say the inefficiency of that just moggles the mind and also the expense of doing that when you're doing it. And then if you look at a, at a conflict zone where you have people actually shooting at you trying to blow up your petrol trucks, uh, that drives up the cost even more. Without a doubt. The fully burdened cost of fuel is subject of great debate. But 10 to $50 a gallon are some of the more acceptable numbers. I've seen estimates as high as $400. Um, in, a, in an aid and reconstruction scenario, Scenario, though, I think that the value of what you can bring in instead of fuel is something that's very hard to quantify. So a truckload of penicillin or a truckload of bottled water or a truckload of diesel fuel. If you can figure out ways to get the penicillin there before everything else, then logically in, a, in an aid scenario, I'd rather move penicillin, food, baby formula, whatever it is, than fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at uh, this type of system we have in, in the slide, I know that the systems you develop actually are to be very simple, mm -hmm. be able to uh, train people locally to be able to maintain it and also provide uh, any kind of uh, backup spare parts or filters, what have you, that you need. 
How do you pre-stage all that and plan it so that the people have exactly what they need, but again, it's not overburdening the whole system. They're paying for more than what they actually could use or what they really need within these local communities. Well, the nice thing is the, the work that I recently did in Afghanistan, what I found was a reasonably robust uh, group of people. There were graduates with master's degrees in electrical engineering that went to school in Pakistan. There were people that were Afghan expats that lived in the U.S. that came back. And there's a great number of different civilian contracting agencies supporting both the military and the aid communities in Afghanistan. So there's definitely a willingness there. There's a hunger for knowledge. The key thing is, within any development scenario, and from my point of view, you have to leave the greatest percentage of value on the ground that you can. So flying me from here to Afghanistan to address a problem because there's a software glitch in your diesel electric load study um, machinery doesn't make any sense. Leaving right. someone behind that understands how it works and there, you know, every situation I've been in, the local national population has been incredibly resourceful much more inventive than even I would think of. They're, they, they live outside the box that I think in. So they're much more adaptable to the solutions and, and very amenable to learning. And I think this is one of the things that uh, the, the real, I guess zeal is about the only answer I could, or the term I could think of. Uh, they have a zeal to learn, they have a, a zeal to give. And this is certainly a very different impression you get from the international media, how people don't care, they're not involved in their local communities, they're waiting for the international community to take care of them. I've been in 79 countries, been you know at this now virtually 40 years, and I find it to be the exact opposite. So looking at your, uh, the experiences that you've had in these various countries, what would be your impression as far as uh, the locals and how can they be uh, involved in what's going on? Is it the fact of asking, the fact of giving, or is the fact that we just, no one really wants to listen to what their needs are and how they want, they, they conceive of learning? I don't know how well I can speak to that, but my principal understanding is this. I mean, the slide that you see on screen right now is an idea of what it takes to get logistics into Afghanistan. The thing that I do understand, though, is there's a great, there's a lot of different ways that you can basically shorten your logistics chain. You can source things in country. Um, the thing that I don't understand, and, and it's something that I struggle to learn, is the fact that we have, you know, development dollars. And the functional emphasis mm -hmm. prior to Afghans First, for instance, was build buildings, fix roads, build bridges, but there wasn't anything there saying we have to make sure that we leave as much of the money behind in country as possible by using local national contractors. I mean, some of the, the hallmarks and the good things that I see in this are things like the uh, Jalalabad San Diego Sister Cities program where they're doing things like working with IT technologies and being able to do training in that in Jalalabad. Um, Japigo up in Baltimore is working with uh, various different sort of maternal health uh, related issues and doing midwife training. It was one of the projects I remember learning about when I was over there. And that's basically the best way it works. But I think within all of this, you've got to survey the local populace and understand the groundwork well, which there's a great many people out there that are good at that. And I think there's a great many people out there that could learn more about basically ramping up their own capabilities in those areas. This is one of the projects that you've been working on that I find very impressive, uh, looking at the Himalayas and uh, bringing in this advanced, but yet in many ways very simple technologies. How can this be transferred to the people there? Well, this project was actually uh, one that Bertie Windpower worked on with another company called Sustainable Energy Services Afghanistan. It was a 100 kilowatt wind turbine install in Panjshir, powers the governor's complex, and it was basically driven by a local national install. The training, the maintenance is all done locally. That's fantastic. And thank you for being with us, Ted Vogel, president of 12 South Energy Services. And thank you for uh, being with us as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet. We're back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. I'm Dr. Sam Hancock, the President and Executive Director of Emerald Planet in Washington, D.C. as we come to you on a weekly basis covering the issues, the technologies, the services, and the people that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. 
As you know, we're going towards 9 billion folks on the planet and how we're going to take care of them to feed and clothe, provide the fuel, the education, uh, the basic infrastructure that's needed for all these folks, but at a level where it actually enhances the quality of life and not decreases that. Many people are saying that the earth just can't handle 9 billion souls, but it seems like they're coming anyway. And so we have to have the best minds, the best technology, and the best intellectual property available to us that we can actually move this forward. Someone who's actually traveled around the globe, looked at uh, many of the issues as far as international development and aid, and how we can develop the best policies to deal with this, is uh, Tori Hogan. She is the uh, creator, founder of Beyond Good Intentions, and also is the author of a book entitled Beyond Good Intentions, A Journey into the Reality of International Aid. And Tori, welcome. Thank you so much, Sam. It's a pleasure glad to be to, here today. Glad to have you here. You're traveling around the globe, but uh, actually you're from the Washington, D.C. area, so it's like coming home. Born and raised. That's right. Uh, that's fantastic. Tell us a little bit about uh, getting started. I know that uh, you were uh, in Kenya, and you got started in an internship there, and then progressed into this internationally renowned author, so uh, you've really morphed in uh, way beyond that, those days. It's, it's been an interesting decade, for sure. It all started when I was about 20 years old, and I had this real feeling that I needed to do something for the world. I needed to do good. I was originally thinking I would be a geneticist, and after an experience in Lebanon, those dreams went out the window, and I felt this calling to be a humanitarian aid worker. So this all began really in the summer of 2002 when I was an intern for Save the Children. And I mean, it, that's the perfect place if you're a bleeding heart, you know, save the children. You're, surely you're going to spend your summer saving children. Um, but I was faced with the brutal reality that a lot of the aid that I had such high hopes in wasn't really all that it was cracked up to be. And uh, I had a moment in a, in a camp, um, a refugee camp on the Somali border with a boy who stood up as I was interviewing the class and said, a lot of aid workers come and go and nothing ever changes. And if the aid was actually effective, we wouldn't still be living like this. So do you think you have the answer to our problems? And it was my moment of, oh my goodness, I think I might be part of your problems. And that's the day that I became, I guess you could say, an aid critic. And I've been spending the last uh, 10 years trying to find answers about how international aid can be more effective. Well, this is one of the things uh, we, in many ways, we have a similar way. We're a generation apart from each other. Uh -huh. But when I was uh, first in India many, many years ago, uh, the guy was saying that you need to work with the, uh, you know, local uh, industries and, and organizations that are actually providing the training and giving the money to the people within the local community. Because they said anything that comes through, you know, just government or large multinationals may not get to the people who actually need it. And so that was an eye-opening experience for me, and it sounds like you had the same thing in Kenya. Absolutely. You hit it right on the head. I mean, locally conceived, locally driven, that's the only way that most of these aid projects are ever going to be effective, because there needs to be that sense of um, local ownership. Well, it's local ownership, but also, too, you're, uh, you're involving all the generations within mm -hmm. the community. We've had this, uh, this slide up here, and I think this is... Absolutely uh, beautiful and fantastic. Yeah. But let's get into some of these others that tell some of the story. So then you decided that, hey, I want to do something beyond good intentions. Right. I like that uh, title. So how did you come up with that title? And then we'll talk, you know, as the, the research evolved on your book. Well, as I thought more about the aid industry, and it truly is an industry, and I don't feel strange about using that word with it. Um, I, I started to realize that there was no shortage of good intentions. There was an enormous amount of heart in the people that were trying to do this work. These are not bad people. Yeah, they really want to do good. They do. They, they really have the, they think the best interest of the people, that are their target communities or target individuals, uh, yet it's still our cultural mix, the socioeconomic backgrounds just somehow seems to get in the way. Often. I mean, there is, unfortunately, an enormous amount of hubris involved in this assumption that we have the answers for the developing world, which is usually not the case. And a lot of aid workers go in with the best of intentions, and they sometimes either conform to the realities of the aid industry, which is just saying, well, it's broken, but I'll do it anyway. Um, or they bail out after a few years and get burnout, which happens quite often. And uh, then we don't see them anymore. It's, it's a hard reality, but um, I wanted to find hope in this, and that's why I started Beyond Good Intentions in 2006. 
And I traveled around the world for a year, uh, actually as a filmmaker, and I was filming in 10 different countries about you know, what is happening out there, the, both the good and the bad. How can we make this more effective? Is aid really as broken as it sounds, uh, or are there solutions on the horizon? Well, looking at the, uh, the film experience that you had, you know, through that, and I think this is really, uh, Tori, the best way of doing it, you really had to get down with the local people to find out what their thoughts are. You're not just standing back, you know, 10,000 yards right. in a wide angle lens saying, hey, this is what's really going on in this community. You have to really get into the homes, into the schools, the hospitals, uh, you know, out into the gardens and all that. And you really get to, kn to know people yeah. and what they're thinking and how they're thinking. So how did you use this notion and uh, this art of filmmaking to really get to know the people and what they're thinking and then be able to translate that into a greater story? It was my one, probably my favorite project that I've ever done. And that is because what, as an aid worker, I was coming in and saying, I'm here to help and you're here to receive. And when I came in as a filmmaker, I was really the learner. I said, I would love to hear your story. And suddenly they were in the power position in a way saying, here's what I have to offer you. And that and is that learning. It's amazing, Tori, how you know, people really want to share their story if they somebody's do. just willing to listen. Absolutely. Well, we all do, right? Um, and throughout the, the last 10 years, my favorite experiences have been those those one-on-one -on -one conversations deep in the village, really connecting with the people. I've forced myself to learn a lot of languages so that I could do that on a more one-on-one -on -one basis uh, in a meaningful way without needing translators. And um, it has been so rewarding. Well, looking at that, as far as the, uh, the stories we're telling, I know you have this in your book, uh, Beyond Good Intentions, A Journey into the Realities of International Aid. Uh, tell us a little bit about some of these realities and what, in this program we're the good news folks. I so, so there's a lot of uh, you know a lot of the negative stories out there but what are some of the things that you were actually to find some of the good stories that people said you know there was this aid organization they were trying to do this but we could work together and we ended up with something that mm -hmm. we could really use. Yeah well there were I was searching for hope in this book the premise of the book actually is that I go back to the refugee camp to find that kid that changed my life, the, the boy who made the comment back in 2002, because I wanted to thank him. And I found that that was a very important thing for me to do. People change our lives all the time, and you know the opportunity to go and express that gratitude is so priceless. So that's why I went, and that's why the book exists. But along the way, I ended up traveling through Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda, both looking for the boy and also looking for answers about aid. Mm -hmm. And as I progressed uh, across East Africa, I kind of felt that the, the hope kept continuing a little bit more and more with each country. So it's kind of like the sun down, you know, it keeps uh, getting a little further away as we move towards the <laughs> well, night. Well, it's like a gradient, apparently. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's wonderful programs in Kenya, but the ones that I happened to see were really having trouble with pleasing their donors and, you know, not having a lot of autonomy in the work that they were doing. By the time I got to Uganda, I was finding that a lot of the organizations that were rather far off the beaten path weren't having access to aid organizations. And therefore, they were forced to do it themselves, to figure out solutions on their own. And the innovation I saw at the grassroots level in the, uh, in the bush of Uganda was absolutely amazing. I found individuals who were transforming whole communities. And I think that's where the majority of my hope comes from. It's, it's you, it's me, it's the people I've met along the way. It's one person at a time changing things for the people around them. And by the time I got to Rwanda, I was seeing uh, you know, the introduction of business approaches to, to changing the world. Mm -hmm. I was seeing the Rwandan government taking control of their own development and telling big organizations like USAID, listen, here are our priorities. Are you in or are you out? And this is a lot of positive uh, movement in the aid industry mm -hmm. that I'm seeing. And it's very encouraging. There are still a lot of problems, but there, there's uh, glimmers of hope as well. Well, as long as there's human beings, we're always going to have problems, and uh, we're never going to solve everything. Uh, even uh, with your young life, as you move on through, there's going to be a <laughs> next generation saying, oh, we've got to get out there, and uh, we've got to figure out what's, uh, what's going on. But uh, looking at these, uh, the bags of uh, food aid and we have uh -huh. there, uh, as a backdrop, what are some of the, the things that you saw that are in local communities, small, but they're having huge impact among the families and, and the communities within these more isolated communities? 
uh, one of my favorite examples was uh, a group called Buconza Joint Savings and uh, Finance. Uh, and they were doing great work in the small village on the Congo-Uganda border. And it was because this man, Pineto, had been trained to be what was called a change agent. And um, he went back to his own community. He basically taught everyone how to identify the, the problems that they were having and brainstorm solutions, but then also to really focus on the fact that they needed money. That was the, that was the key. Um, you know, for things to get better, most of us just need jobs. And uh, the, the communities needed money, and so they started trying to figure out, well, how can we make money? All right, we can sell little things here and there, but we still need new capital coming in. So they started an incredible um, uh, savings and loan program. And they did it in a very small and, and constructive way. Uh, I find, unfortunately, that a lot of the microfinance groups now that are coming out are are not um, in line with the original concept. In yeah, that and it's many of these are very large multinational banks. That yeah. look at this. this is a new niche that we need to go out and mine it's as far as new customers and new right. profits. It's a business, and it literally, you're knocking on doors saying, do you need a loan? I mean, it's so competitive at this point. But this, this community really knew how to do it at a grassroots level. And they also